Okay, so uh, welcome everybody. Good morning. Thank you for uh, taking the time this morning to join us for the third PBEC Pacific Basin Economic Council Roundtable Dialogue meeting of 2020. Um, obviously, this is a virtual webinar. It's, it's something that uh, most of you are now getting familiar with, if it's not on a daily basis, it's at least a few times a week. Um, and we are joined by members and friends from across the globe today, which is an obvious benefit of this uh, online platforms that are being utilized more and more. Um, and we look forward to obviously still resuming face-to-face -face dialogue in not too distant future. So today, uh, in a second, I'll be handing over to our chairman, Andrew Weir, for opening remarks. But we will be joined then by our special guest, as you can see, our colleague and uh, from APEC Secretariat in Singapore, the Executive Director, Dr. Tan Tree Rebecca Fatima Maria, the first lady, in fact, to hold such a position at APEC. So we're really honored to have her today to give us a quick update on the uh, progress of APEC 2020 in Malaysia, uh, despite the COVID-19. Um, I saw that you were busy last night, Rebecca, already with the SOM meeting. <laughs> yes. Officer. You were tweeting yes. uh, images of uh, global, of global uh, yeah. um, participation yeah. through virtual means. So yeah. it's it really good to see that. Um, obviously, we're conscious at PBEC of webinar fatigue. Hence, we've instituted different means um, and a variety of means of which to stay connected and engaged with our members. I hope our members are enjoying that and making use of all the different channels that we are on, on LinkedIn official website and our newsletter now that's going out on a monthly basis. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to our chairman, Andrew Weir for opening remarks. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mike, and a very warm welcome to everybody. And a big thank you, Mike, to all the efforts you've been putting in, uh, building on the Great Base Debbie uh, put in place. Um, and I think um, we're very comfortable with how vibrant um, PBEC is. So thank you very much. Can I just check you can hear me, Mike? Perfectly, yeah, loud and clear. Good. I was a bit worried. You looked uh, as a bit confused as, as I was speaking. And, and now I realise it's because you could hear me rather than not hearing me. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to say a very warm welcome to everybody. And maybe I can make um, um, with, uh, just a special warm welcome to Rebecca. I mean, we're very honoured to have you, Rebecca. Um, the links with APEC are so important and that is one of the really fundamental aspects of the DNA of PBEC. So thank you so much for making the time. And I, I, if anybody has webinar fatigue, it must be you. So I, I greatly appreciate that. And we'll come back to you in a second. But I'm also delighted, a, a, a good friend of a number of ours, uh, Rob Kirk is, is dialing in. Rob, Rob, as you know, led The Economist um, in the region and did some fantastic content and is now based in Los Angeles with Geoeconomics. And I'm delighted Rob, through the help of Anson Bailey, has agreed rather like Ben Sinfendorfer to provide a very interesting sort of updated strategic slash economic analysis as part of the membership. Um, I'm also delighted to uh, introduce, uh, we have Helen Kwan, who's the Assistant Director General of the Hong Kong Trade and Industry. Uh, department who's been involved in trade negotiations. Welcome, Helen. And a new member, the AIA CEO, uh, someone well known to us, uh, Peter Crew. Very well welcome, Peter. And of course, we're absolutely delighted from Adelina's introduction that Tan Shi Lim, the executive chairman and founder of Top Club, uh, has agreed to join our board. And we're delighted. Um, we're delighted to welcome such a distinguished gentleman. We're also very pleased that uh, two Emeritus Chairmen, uh, Warren Luke, who's put body and soul into PBEC, who's dialing in from Hawaii, and our good friend Wilford Wong. Uh, Wilford Wong is on the line as well, my predecessor who did so much for PBEC. And of course, we're delighted we have Miguel Abowitz, the uh, head of Abowitz Power Corps in, uh, in the Philippines, who gave a wonderful webinar before. So a very, very warm welcome to uh, those people. I'd also like to mention uh, we have Ritesh Singh, the founder and chief economist of Indonomics, and a columnist at Asia Nikau joining us, and of course, our other board members. So a very warm welcome. Um, what I suggested just very briefly, uh, before passing to Rebecca, a couple of points. Uh, I think PBEC is heading in the right direction. I think we've become very technological driven. Um, we've become very agile. 
Uh, we're looking at how we can connect in the region without necessarily having chapters, but having round tables or webinars. And I think we've looked very carefully, like every organization, at our cost base and how we do things. And a big thank you to you, Mike, and your team uh, on how you've done that and to Anson, our, our treasurer, because I think our affairs are certainly well stabilized. But what I would also just say is never has it been more important for an organization such as PBEC and APEC. Look at the tensions uh, on trade through the US-China, EU-China, EU-US strains. Uh, look at the regional strains and we look at the effect of the virus, which has a different effect in different economies and possibly has brought back more of a t returning role of national governments and more of a challenge to those of us who believe in globalization and, and regional collaboration. These, these are very interesting times. And being based in Hong Kong, of course, the Hong Kong social unrest and political situation and the security law issues with regard to Beijing and the approach being taken is actually fundamental to business as well. So there's a lot of aspects uh, around at the moment and those of us living in Hong Kong feel in many ways one's experiencing a bit of a tipping point. So it's a very good time to get so many experienced people on the call. The format we have is it'd be lovely to, to hear uh, from Rebecca and then it'd be, it'd be great to hear from Rob and, and Ritesh and it would be excellent to hear from other members uh, their perspectives. So that by the end of an hour, we feel we've learned something different. We have a more informed perspective, but also we feel we have some positive views we want to take forward and disseminate as PBEC. So I just want to give a preamble. That is really the purpose of the webinar. Mm -hmm. And really, Rebecca, we're so pleased to have you. We'd love to hear from you direct about what's going on at APEC. We were greatly looking forward to the conference in Malaysia. Our dear friend mm -hmm. Adelina Chong was very excited about it. And, uh, yeah. and of course, um, no, no doubt um, we're going to be doing virtual things, but um, we, we feel we're missing out a bit because here was going to be a conference right in, in, in Asia again after the ones yeah. before were in a bit more remote location. So we were a bit disappointed, but uh, we totally understand. So over to you, Rebecca, and please take thank your you. time to share with us what you want. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and thank you, Michael, for putting this together. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm assuming we're all in the same time zone. Are we, Mike, Andrew? Are we in different time apart zones? From Rob, apart from Rob in uh, Los Angeles. In, oh, okay, okay. So, oh, and uh, we have Rob? Ritesh in India. Oh, and Ritesh okay. in India. Uh, all but right. So Rob, he's within 15 hours of our time zone. <laughs> so it's not too bad. Um, yeah, thank you again for this kind invitation. Uh, yesterday, we had the first virtual extraordinary uh, senior officials meeting since uh, the pandemic. And there we had uh, 60 or uh, participants. All the senior officials from the 21 economies were on board and from eight time zones. So it was, it was a early morning for some late in the night for some, but, but we managed. I mean, we went on till about midnight um, Singapore time and it was quite fruitful. You know, as, as they say, this year started with a lot of enthusiasm, uh, Malaysia's host year, and uh, Malaysia had laid out this wonderful, wonderful plan for all of us. But as they say, man proposes, God disposes. So we didn't see it coming. And uh, we had the first uh, informal meeting of the senior officials in in December at uh, in in Langkawi it was lovely, and there Malaysia laid out its plan for its year. They they shared with us their their theme, which was optimizing human potential towards uh, a, sh a future of shared prosperity. You know, it it breaks my heart when I when I revisit the the theme, um, and their their priorities made a lot of sense then, right? The first priority was improving the narrative of trade and investment. The second priority was inclusive economic participation through the digital economy and technical technology tech and technology. And the third was driving innovative sustainability. Now, so when when and then we had our first um, uh, senior officials meeting in in Putrajaya in February. This was before everything came sort of crashing down as it were. And uh, so there was a lot of going back and forth, looking, uh, reviewing the priorities. Did it, did it still make sense? 
you know, for, so from, from my perspective, and, and I shared this with the senior, with the Malaysian team, those priorities make absolute sense. It's just about how you look at it. It's a perspective. Yes, given this pandemic, it is all the more important for us to look at trade and investment again. Um, it is not just about liberalizing trade mm. and investment. It's also about managing dis disruptions. So how do you include those important risk management aspects into the trade and investment? Um, all the more important now that we look at, we take this opportunity to look at structural reform, to look at how we can incorporate more of the digital aspects into trade and investment. So for me, it is, it is not really going back to the drawing board, but really looking at it from a different perspective and having that narrative. There's, there's, there, there's a lot of discussion now on the relevance of, of, trade, in, of, of uh, trade agreements, for example. So for me, it still makes a lot of sense. It's just that um, we need to incorporate these lessons that we're learning, the lessons that we're learning from this pandemic into our trade and investment narrative. So the, the more intense discussions on supply chains. And last night, that was what happened. There was discussions on how do we, um, you know, let me just take a few steps back. On the 5th of May, the ministers related to trade of APEC, MRT, yeah, released a statement about how we should re be responding to this pandemic. And key to that was collaboration and coordination of initiatives and sharing of information. So these this are very important. The importance of also keeping markets open. So these were key messages coming from the ministers. And, and last night when we were having our discussion, this, this was exactly the areas that we focused on. How do we have a more coordinated approach to how we deal with this pandemic? Um, how do we collaborate more? How do we share information? What, how, what more effective mechanisms can we have for sharing of this important information? How do we ensure that, yes, we appreciate that each of us uh, are having challenges in this time, but how do we manage and how do we you know, deal with the need to protect our, our own first? the livelihoods of our own first. So there is a balance. So the balance uh, between having that business, business needs an open economy, but you also have these constraints about looking after your own. So that kind of delicate balance. So those are some of the things that we discussed. Um, supply chains. This, this calls into question your supply chains. Uh, concentration, is that an issue? How do we manage this, this con issue of concentration? Should we include, expand it to be more diverse? There's the question of uh, economies looking at onshoring. Is that an answer? Or do you need more onshoring or do we need more diversification? So those, those are things that, that, uh, that we had to discuss. And when you talk of resilience, what is resilience at the end of the day? When you talk of resi having resilient supply chains, it's, it's um, sometimes the discussion can be very high level, very theoretical, but on the ground for businesses, what does it mean? So we had the opportunity to have uh, the ABEC chair, the Asia, the APEC Business Advisory Council chair, Dr. Rohana come and, and talk to us about what they are doing. So even as the senior officials are having their own virtual meetings and planning virtual meetings going forward, ABEC has already had three virtual meetings discussing various aspects. Um, they, had, they, they had a discussion on the digital economy, on supply chains, et cetera, keeping markets open. They're having one, I think, tomorrow or, or today, tomorrow, on, on SMEs. How do you manage SMEs, uh, support SMEs during these this, uh, very challenging times? So that's, that's um, you know, work that's happening on different, different uh, work streams of APEC. Because ABAC, the Business Advisory Council, is a key part of us. And the fact that they are going on, in spite of the fact that we may not have the summit, the, the fact that they are fully engaged um, with the interests of the 
APEC as a region, the economy of the APEC as a region in mind is, is so, it's so reassuring for us because at the end of the day, policymakers must take the cue from the business. That's, you know, that's, Rebecca, this is yes. a, a remarkable uh, summary. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, just a couple of points, really interesting. Um, I think something, Mike, we may wish to take forward. This linkage of inclusiveness with technology. Um, I think it's fair to say, uh, our, one of our deputy chairman, George, Dr. Uh, G George Lam is, is chair of the cyber port and is, leads the, in Hong Kong, the digital Belt and Road um, initiative. But, but so he'd be fast, the linkage of technology to inclusion and that broader sustainability yep. angle is something yep. I think would resonate. And not enough organizations have yet done that, Rebecca. So that's fascinating, uh, that particular point. Um, the other one is the relevance of trade. The point you make about the debate is also something where I think we need to be um, coming out, reminding people of the relevance of, uh, of okay. trade, the importance of trade. But you mentioned the relevance of trade agreements. And is this in the context of um, recap and everything? <laughs> and, and of course, being very much in the center of um, the US being in and being out of, of um, the enormous big trade agreement out here. Can you just explain a bit more where you're coming from on that? OK, you know, um, all of us, for, for me, uh, the, my priority had always been the multilateral trading system. Mm. For businesses, as, um, a uniform set of rules means predictability, transparency, good for business. The, but when you, when you have 160 con countries trying to reach agreement, it's, such a, it's, it's a challenge and a half. So you have like-minded economies coming together, like-minded parties coming together and doing what they can to push trade, push investment. That's, that's the value of those trade agreements. Now, for the longest time, we were focused on liberalization, right? So now you need to include, you need to revisit the trade agreements to include aspects of managing pandemics when they happen. How, how, what kind of preparedness, risk management, emergency preparedness must be embedded in this. So what happened here, if, if you notice, I see, yes. when, you had, when you had the pandemic, uh, economy started putting restrictions, export restrictions, you know, uh, controls. So if, if that is dealt within, and, and of course, people, you know, there was a lot of uh, going back and forth saying, oh, you're going to do this. You, it has to be done within the context of the WTO. Da, da. So, but if you embed this, then, then there is that conversation that we can have among ourselves on, yeah, the, this, is, this is a situation we are faced with. Um, within this agreement, how do we, how we, how do we manage this situation so and that, support that, each other, you know? Yeah, so that's interesting because tr trade agreements as written now, as you say, a very uh, open. Lib liberal tool. Liberalizing. They're yeah. open and it's all about optimization. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll probably bring in a couple of other people uh, soon, Rebecca, but just on this, then that's linked to supply chain. It's very, very interesting. A school of thought is emerging in the West. I, I know uh, President Trump's come out at, you know, at an extreme view, questioning these supply chains, but in the UK and in Europe, and also interestingly, even the China-based supply chains. Questions are being asked, I think, not about the future of the supply chains, sorry, that those supply, global supply chains will go. It's exactly the point you raised, the mitigation and what risk management can be put into them. And something which has been um, coming up in Europe in particular is it's how to get cushions and circuit breakers and um, really just um, how to mitigate the reliance on one part of the train. And uh, I th my, my suggestion, I'd be interested in your view, Rebecca, and then maybe we can bring Rob in, would be that probably supply chains and global trade would largely share the same shape as before, but there'd be a lot more checks and balances and a lot more um, risk management and uh, circuit breakers in there to protect national economies. Very interested in your view. And then maybe we could open up to Rob. Um, just, just uh, we, we discussed 
supply. We, like I said, yesterday we, we talked a, a, a lot about supply chains and how do you keep them you know, resilient? As I said, it, sometimes the, 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 the conversation can be very theoretical. Yeah. But really, let's, let's look at it. Yes, the supply chains have been disrupted. There is no question about it. And, but we also see that there is opportunity through this, this uh, for, for me, the trade agreements, ensure that you keep, you build that resilience within, within yes, the... Within, within that framework. Within that. And that's why regional trade agreements are important. You know, and for me to see RCEP, RCEP become a reality, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that's, that's really where it's at. Um, I, I was one of the architects of our set because we saw a lot of potential in it. We, we had the ASEAN plus one agreements. We had the ASEAN plus three, uh, ASEAN um, with the plus six, right? So we said, and each of these agreements had their own set of rules. So we said, you know, for, for us to strengthen, as it were, the, the, the supply chains, it's to bring together all the parties can you just give me a second, please? Give me a second. Oh, I... sure. I think we've lost Rebecca for a second, though. Yeah, Andrew, I think she just had to take a quick call. <laughs> just oh, well, to... look, in, in that case, could I suggest, um, I, I think this would be a very good time to bring you in, Rob. Um, he, hearing this, and all, obviously sitting in LA, um, which we will claim as part of the Pacific for the purposes of APEC. But it is part of APEC, so it you is. Can so, yeah. it in that regard. <laughs> so, sorry, folks, you know, this is what happens when you work from home, the doorbell goes. Oh, and, Rebecca, uh, we, we just assumed, as I said, you were sitting outside the headquarters of APEC. We <laughs> so, so coming back, so that's why, you know, when we, when we were talking of building that uh, regional resilience, we, we pushed so hard for our set because we said, one, you build... Uh, you, you look at the rules, and this is a bit technical, the accumulation of, of the rules, you know. Um, so the products, or the inputs from the region is considered as local. Yeah. I, so you I, get I, better market. You understand that? So that's, that's, that's why that was so important for us. And that is one of the key strengths of our set. Yeah. And, and that in itself will help you build that, that resilience that we're talking about. Yeah. Otherwise, I, what are you, you know, what are you saying? What are you you doing? Know? I think, Rebecca, yeah. we may well come back to you in the future on RCEP because it's been something we've been getting our minds around. <laughs> you sound like you're a good advocate. Rebecca, that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could just bring in Rob now um, in LA. And we, we, when you were offline, we were just joking. We definitely claim that as part of PBEC. Um, Rob, sitting where you are, uh, as we emerge from, or do we emerge, you know, different paces of recovery, uh, different stages of resilience uh, on, on the virus, a lot of narrative about future of trade and supply chains. Uh, Rob, you know, with your economist and strategy hat on, very keen to hear your reflections. Wow. Well, that, that's kind of a tall order, Andrew. Uh, I guess just picking up on what we were hearing from Rebecca, um, I guess three points real quickly. One is uh, it's encouraging to hear that it's kind of enthusiasm about RCEP. The general consensus, at least as I've heard it among economists and analysts, is that that is, and it's, it takes nothing away from the hard efforts that I'm sure have been going into it, and it sounds like Rebecca has directly contributed to, but that it is less of an agreement and, and represents less impact than what we've already seen with, for example, the CPTPP. Yeah. And the CPTPP being something that's really fundamentally transformed things, even with the U.S. dropping out. And I think that's another interesting area for discussion. Will the U.S. maybe come in after, say, the general election later this year, which seems likely to go towards a new direction in leadership? Uh, but in any case, um, RCEP is definitely encouraging in, the, in that it's trying to encompass yeah. uh, a much broader array of economies. Uh, notably China and India. So that's kind of the groundbreaking part of it. I guess what a lot of analysts are more skeptical about versus the TPP, which notably a lot of key APEC nations, including Malaysia, of course, are part of, is that uh, CPTPT, uh, TPP really has a kind of regulatory framework uh, built around it, where, where RCEP seems a little more conceptual. So I guess you could call the former more aspirational and what we have presently 
with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, something that's that's more uh, truly yeah. integrated. Yeah. And, yeah. and then I would I would just uh, on top of all this, and I'll you know we we go on and on, but just to leave some items there to think about. So we've got you know the the current agreement, this aspirational agreement, and of course within this mix, uh, and those are all positive, regardless of which one you think is more strong or or will bring about more results. Or if they will, in combination, perhaps bring about a really positive change. And a, a quick sidebar, uh, I was in Beijing at the time that, I mean, based in Beijing and had been there for some 10 years. Uh, China was very frightened about the TPP when it included the U.S. <laughs> and that was one of the, and you noticed as the TPP was beginning to take shape, uh, they started really getting on board with RCEP. So anyway, there's some interesting mm. dynamics there. But in yeah. particular, what, what U.S. commentators, uh, whether you're looking at things economically or politically, I mean, Hong Kong has been on everyone's mind the last few yes. days, uh, owing to the um, National People's Congress, a decision to what, according to, a, I think, is by and large a consistent Western analysis mm -hmm. that China has elected to go against the terms of the joint declaration dating back to 1984. And this is set to pose some very radical developments in terms of U.S.-China, specifically U.S.-Hong Kong relations. And, and that's, I think, going to be, over the next few weeks, probably the number one thing yeah. regarding U.S.-China slash Asia, because, of course, Hong Kong is more than just a platform into China, although that what it, that's what it's historically best known for and its greatest value, certainly, to the mainland is. Hong Kong is really a platform for all of Asia as I'm sure is one of the reasons Andrew and, and the team have uh, the organization based in Hong Kong. And, and I know APEC, you know, has a lot of integrated uh, activities with Hong Kong. So I, I would just leave on this point, and I'm happy to discuss further if people have other yeah. aspects of what I'm touching on uh, of interest to, to delve into uh, in more detail. But uh, okay. what we have now with the a decision uh, by Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State, to uh, notify Congress that uh, Hong Kong, interestingly enough, before there's even actually been details about the new national security legislation that we should be hearing about, I believe, today uh, in Asia, or Beijing time, anyway, um, that already Hong Kong has lost its autonomy. That kicks in a whole host of uh, new policies towards Hong Kong. Number one relating to this organization is that it looks like Hong Kong is uh, in line for losing its what's essentially an FTA, a free trade agreement with the U.S. Now, I'll put one caveat to all that, and that is uh, U.S. President Donald Trump, uh, not only is he mercurial uh, by nature, but the power of his office allows him to make selective choices about how to implement this. So it doesn't necessarily mean automatically Hong Kong will lose all of that status, but it could. And so that's yeah. going to be this new, um, yeah. you know, element yeah. to, to all the tensions that are going on. Yeah. But I'll, and I'll conclude on this. Curiously enough, uh, ex-China Hong Kong with potential positive long-term ramifications, uh, just like uh, Rebecca was mentioning about supply chains and so forth, just as we've seen with the U.S.-China trade war, a lot of spillover effects are actually positive for particularly well, ASEAN yeah, countries. That's right, yeah. So we could see out of this, mm -hmm. although it's nothing I think anyone really wanted, um, given where Beijing and Washington are, are standing off against one another, you could see a lot of movement towards Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, yeah. Philippines, you know, those economies. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, Rob, we've raised that in, uh, in previous calls. We see it, I, I see it in my own client base, um, even very strong mainland companies looking to diversify, yeah. to take their their equation, sorry, to take their activity away from the equation of U.S. Mm. China trade yeah. tariff calculations, all of this. Um, but what one has seen is an increasing challenge of other countries in Asia, um, by, by the U.S. But can I just ask you, Rob, um, mm. um, moving you on to political economy? Sure. Um, you know, only a few years ago, everything was fine. Um, yes, maybe national, national policies in countries could have been better at mitigating mm. effects of globalization, but the world economy was going well. Then initially when uh, President Trump challenged China, I think most of us thought it was saber rattling and mm. then a deal would be struck. And what has happened is the Pandora's box has been opened and it's very hard mm. to close it. And now it's become 
a truly partisan issue with almost a rush to the bottom of who can attack China the most in the political mm. sphere. Um, a question for you, Rob, is, um, is there the sense that once the election is, uh, this is obviously going to carry on at least to the election, is there a sense that more common sense globally can prevail on some of these relationships once certain big elections are out of the way? Or is this seen as really the way of things to come for ne the next five, 10 years? Well, um, whatever one might think about the US, and I, I have to be careful here because as my accent betrays, and, and you've probably <laughs> already guessed, those who don't know me based on where I live, I am American. But, but knowing that America doesn't universally enjoy a favorable reputation worldwide, I would just say, regardless of what we see really going on at Beijing, Washington, particularly with you know, Donald Trump and, and Xi Jinping and those two administrations. Uh, it's interesting, regarding the uh, national security law um, legislation uh, proposal, the first countries to respond were actually Commonwealth, uh, UK, yeah. Australia, Canada. Yeah. So uh, this goes, I would say, way beyond just the standard US, China tit for tat. And of course, early on, what's so interesting, I mean, even before Trump, if you look at uh, China's proposal for an alternative to the World Bank, uh, and and you know this, this, what it was trying to do with Belt Road, and then um, you know creating the new development bank and these things. Uh, in fact, it was the UK that, that was the first to rush in and say, "Hey, you know, we'll get on board with this." And this was during the Obama administration, which yeah. was supposed to be all for kumbaya, peace and love. We can all get along together. Um, so you already had that standoff occurring. So uh, to answer your question, Andrew, one, I would say bear in mind that in the US, there's a fundamental distrust of the uh, system as it exists uh, currently in China. Um, so that, that's one thing, and that, that would transcend whatever changes might happen come November. Then mm -hmm. secondly, I think what's unfortunately happened for China, regardless of how one wants to see the workings of the world, it really has alienated a lot of countries that were ready to join in its camp. Australia, not that many years ago, was actually practically, you know, I don't know if they went so far as to actually do it. I know the Australian Navy was considering joint maneuvers with the PLA Navy, yes, um, yeah. just with the notion of general, you know, security relationship building. Uh, since then, <laughs> I mean, we've seen, you know, China I, I don't, I don't with think it will relations and on and on and on. Yeah, I don't, I probably don't have to recap all that. But, you know, I'll just say the other thing is, you know, there was supposed to be a golden age uh, with uh, London, Beijing, not, not too many years ago. Yeah, and, yeah. and all that's kind of gone away. So I, I would say, I would just, my, my main point on this would be the political economic side of things. Yes, expect probably much more intense rivalry between the world's two largest economies. But I think, unfortunately, the moves China has made, whether or not one wants to justify them for rights of history or, or China's sovereignty or prerogatives, whatever, they haven't won too many allies. So the, the, I would say that the battle has gone way beyond just US-China. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Rob. That's a, a wonderful summary and a, a, ver a very interesting conclusion. If I could just ask Ben, uh, who's well known to us, Ben Simfendorfer. He's a director of PBEC. He's co-founder of Silk Road Associates and really has remarkable insight into the region and a very granular insight to share his perspective. I think, Ben, future of trade, patterns of trade, supply chains. And then uh, afterwards, I uh, said, so, so delighted that Ritesh Singh is joining us from Indi India, who's the founder and chief economist of Indonomics, and uh, as you know, as a columnist at Asia Nikkei. Um, maybe, uh, Ritesh, you could speak after, after Ben. Over to you, Ben. Uh, Rebecca, Andrew, uh, Rob, thanks very much for some, some insightful comments. Um, if, if I could just make a, a few points, uh, we're actually engaged in a very deep six, in, a, a six industry study at the moment uh, of the global supply chain, speaking with a range of leading MNCs. And if I could frame my thoughts um, in the context of uh, resilience recovery, uh, sorry, um, <clears throat> uh, resilience, uh, uh, resilience recovery and renewal, we're, we're still very much in the resilience phase. And, uh, there is clear fear uh, among global brands at the moment uh, of uh, a wave of bankruptcies across uh, the tier two, tier three supply chain. Global brands will step in to provide funding to tier one suppliers, uh, but it is tier two, tier three that are of most concern. Uh, tier one suppliers at the moment struggling with weak demand, still have um, employees on the books, but production lines are idle. 
the situation cannot continue for long. Um, and so there are fears over the next few months. As we move beyond that, we do see a, you know, a gradual recovery in global demand. Uh, then, then we move into recovery and finally resilience phase. Resilience is very much about moving supply chains uh, mm -hmm. in response to both pressure on uh, costs, but, but also clearly um, US-China trade tensions. Uh, consumer goods are already moving. We've seen smartphones move into Vietnam, computers uh, into Mexico. Uh, these are trends that were present um, uh, for a, a number of years, but will be accelerated uh, over the coming uh, few years. What becomes more interesting then uh, is how the uh, industrial machinery sector, uh, a very high value sector, begins to respond. And certainly in my conversations leading MNCs are now rethinking uh, their supply chain uh, the challenge here is that much of their activity is capital intensive. They may own their own factories. Supply chains are not always quick to move. Uh, but, but clearly, again, that there is fear uh, that uh, reliance on uh, a single source a Chinese supplier is no longer the way to go. Uh, the larger industrials are looking to build out uh, more diversity in their supply chain. That means one of two things. Uh, well, it means two possibilities, either to uh, uh, identify alternative suppliers outside of China uh, or to reshore production. Reshoring production is much harder than people think. There just isn't the capacity back in the United States. There isn't the skills base uh, in the United States for some of these products, but certainly not all. What's likely to go? Uh, PPE and pharmaceutical production, uh, high-end um, machinery equipment, especially anything that it has uh, or touches on the, uh, the, the, the energy sector. Uh, I guess, you know, as my final point, it's worth remembering that the U.S. is the world's largest market. It's not the only market. Uh, and for uh, in my conversations with uh, big European and Japanese companies, uh, they are absolutely committed to China. Uh, China is more often than not their largest market, their fastest growing market. Uh, the market where uh, they see the R&D cycle as moving uh, fastest. Uh, and so they continue to invest uh, in the market and not only for local sale, but also for sale to other emerging markets. And in fact, China's exports uh, of uh, machinery products uh, into the emerging markets, the Belt and Road markets, has been rising fairly rapidly over the last few years, but largely at the expense of the United States. Uh, many of these products are actually produced by American, European, uh, Japanese companies, uh, and they're unlikely to relocate that production home. So. I, I, as, I, you know, as, I, as I mentioned, really, it is a story about short-term resilience. How do we get through the next wave of bankruptcies um, uh, and, and then renewal? How do we think about supply chains? And, and very much, we need to distinguish both protecting ourselves against uh, or from uh, US uh, trade measures, uh, but at the same time, recognizing uh, that there is a bigger market out there, China specifically, the emerging markets more generally, and European Japanese manufacturers are certainly very focused on that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. A uh, uh, fascinating insight. Ben, um, without asking you to give away too many of your trade secrets, what type of things are you being asked to look at? What type of sectors and themes are you being asked to look at by your clients at the moment? So, um, look, the con consumer goods sector has been moving for a while. Uh, where there's greater interest now is that industrial goods sector, which has been reluctant to move. Yeah. Um, and so uh, it, it, as a product category, that's one area. As a country category, for the first time, we get having more robust discussions around Indonesia and the Philippines. Yeah. yeah uh, whereas yeah. primarily it was Vietnam uh, and to a lesser extent Thailand. Yeah, Cambodia. So, yeah, so we're getting genuine momentum into those countries. There are challenges of manufacturing in those countries. There are serious constraints. Um, and equally, uh, because we're now not getting consumer goods companies talking about moving into Indonesia or the Philippines, but also capital goods company, we're going to see some serious bottlenecks uh, around land, labor, uh, logistics. Uh, leading companies are going to be able to get in uh, and, and profit. Uh, laggards will absolutely struggle. Um, but that in turn creates a, a second wave of opportunities, particularly around professional services and financial institutions to help these countries build out yeah. uh, scale at a faster pace. Yeah, thank you, Ben. I mean, just for, to share the, with others, I, I chair with the Trade Development Council here, a working group on industrial parks in the region. And interesting, there's over 160 industrial parks financed by the PRC government in the region, and obviously hundreds of others. Um, 
increasingly, I think one's going to see very proactive measures being brought in uh, by national governments to promote their own uh, industrial parks uh, and industrial zones, and increasingly free zones um, will become quite a major policy tool. I, I think, Mike, it'd be very useful um, if we could discuss and then uh, maybe have a session on industrial parks uh, or other sort of special economic zones in the region. I think that'd be very useful. Um, moving on. Okay, thank you, uh, Ben. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. And Ritesh, a very warm welcome to you, my friend. And really looking forward to hearing, I think, really two things. Uh, your perspective, having heard uh, what we've been talking about so far, but also your sort of on the ground view of what's happening in India and how that's being navigated through. So uh, we are, uh, are you able to hear me? Hello. Yes, Ritesh. You can hear you perfectly, Ritesh. Uh, good morning. It's a little early in India and we are still under lockdown and there is no serious control over the coronavirus and still there is no clarity on how and for how long it will continue uh, uh, till we have uh, contained the viral uh, epidemic. But India is gradually opening up because the cost of lockdown, the economic cost of lockdown is very, very high. Uh, you can see the media reports about lots of migrant workers. Uh, they are seriously stressed and it's a big country, diverse country, and lots of states uh, related issues, pulls and pressure. Uh, hello? Hello? We can hear you. Okay, okay. So, uh, in the meantime, uh, India is also trying to uh, take advantage of some of the global manufacturers. Uh, it wants to invite some of the global manufacturers to have an alternative manufacturing base in India because uh, there is too much dependent on China. Uh, even in case of India, we are too much dependent on China for so many goods from solar panels to electronics, mobile phones. So, uh, Michael wanted me to speak about what are the challenge in inviting uh, global manufacturers to India. So, okay. Yeah. So, one of the major challenge, India has obvious advantage like cheaper labor, a very large and growing market. Now tax, corporate tax rates are also 15 to 20, 15 percent or sub 20 percent for new manufacturing uh, businesses. But uh, in my opinion, the biggest challenge in India is regulatory uncertainty and it's growing with related to tax laws, with related to investment rules, with respect to contract enforcement and also related to import and export policies. So the current regime is a bit uh, turning towards more protectionism. The world is in fact turning uh, inwards, so India is no exception. So India wants to use its large market as a bet to invite global manufacturers to have manufacturing facilities. Uh, and India does have advantage, as I told earlier, but. Uh, this risk related to uncert, uh, regulatory uh, regulation, the kind of regulations we have, multiple regulations, state level, uh, there are instances of a state level uh, government agencies reneasing on context for power uh, sector, for example, renewable powers. They want to reduce the cost of power for uh, distribution to household consumers and industry consumers. So those things are. Uh, the biggest hurdle in India's uh, quest for having a pie, a greater pie of global manufacturing. Uh, that's what I think. Which is, that's really, really interesting. And what, um, do you have a sense on the timeline when it will become clearer what the, the path of emergence from a virus is, or is it still very, very much early days of the response yes i think it will take another quarter to be uh, to let everything normalize especially when it comes to economy because uh, i do foresee further extension of the lockdown maybe for two weeks more though uh, we are 
uh, trying to open up the economy in a guarded way. But the problem that there are hot uh, spots like Maharashtra, uh, Mumbai, uh, you must have heard, yeah. and Delhi. Those uh, regions are very important in terms of industrial and commercial activities, and those are the most affected areas. Yes, yes. So even if uh, the whole economy is opened up, it would be very difficult to uh, open up Mumbai and Delhi and Chennai, which are the industrial hubs. Yes. So yes. that will uh, be a problematic. And of course, uh, logistics uh, has been a great challenge for India for long. Yes. And and now, uh, because of the reverse migration from, uh, there are some states which supply laborers to industrial uh, work, uh, states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Tamil Nadu. So, uh, eastern states like Bihar and UP supply laborers, they are returning because of the lockdown. So, labor shortage is going to be a bit of a problem in many of the industrial hubs like Mumbai, Chennai, and even NCR, uh, Delhi region. Yes, yes. So, uh, this is a one big challenge that we are going to face going forward. Well, I think, uh, Ritesh, thank you so much. Very interesting analysis and very keen to keep that, uh, that discussion um, carrying on. If I could just ask, I, I'm aware we need to, to finish at, at the, the bottom of the hour. Um, re really, I'm just, I am fascinated to think further about uh, in, in the region. And uh, I just thought um, maybe we could just pick up a bit on maybe the situation we're seeing uh, that the ASEAN perspective and maybe uh, I could ask uh, Adelina and uh, Tanshri Reina if there's anything particularly any perspectives you have hearing this with regard to the role of Malaysia the themes you're seeing in Malaysia whether what you've been hearing so far resonates maybe I could ask Adelina first and then maybe Tanshri Reina um, afterwards Hi, Andrew. Hi, Adelina. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. How's everybody doing? I it's think good we're, to all, be... we're all good. We like your backdrop, Adelina. You look very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can't switch my video on, so... <laughs> no, no, so I, I thought uh, maybe you just froze. <laughs> uh, I think it'd be really interesting to hear your perspective, particularly um, what Rebecca Ritesh have been saying um, um, please do, do share what, what you're seeing at the moment uh, in, in ASEAN and, and also in, in Malaysia itself. And then I, I, I think Tanshi Lim wasn't able to join, but I think Tanshi Rayner actually has been able to join. So it'd be mm. useful to get the top club perspective. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for, for this opportunity to share a little bit of our perspective from uh, Malaysia side. I have been speaking to a number of the um, industry leaders, you know, with um, uh, particularly with the um, the ports as well as um, yeah. a, a number of the other, um, you know, large manufacturing uh, houses and uh, services as well. Obviously, retail has gone very, very belly up um, in so many ways. Uh, uh, the ports are suffering as well. They are only at about 50%, you know, production volumes. Uh, the, the key thing I think where Malaysia is concerned is we are looking towards having, you know, a push towards more consumption. And we're looking towards perhaps even for certain policies to be in place and for the government to take a more proactive role uh, in the next few months. Uh, to bring, you know, safety and everything um, as a priority, but also to balance uh, for the economy to, to, you know, be a little bit more robust than where it is right now. We have experienced, there's been a bit of a relax for the, uh, what, what we have over in Malaysia is the movement control order. There's been a little bit of a relaxation in that aspect. So people have started to go back to offices, you know, maybe half of the workforce are back at offices uh, in the last uh, two weeks or so. Uh, we have just come out from the celebration of the uh, 8 Mubarak, um, as you will all well, very well know of. Uh, and, you know, we, it's, it's been very contained, which is a, a very good sign. And so what we are or looking forward to, you know, uh, working also with the, um, the different various ministries is to 
to have that level of um, containment as far as we can in terms of um, layoffs uh, and have more money being pushed, you know, liquidity being pushed into the market. So there's more consumption being um, done as well. Uh, and the supply chain, as we are all talking about, um, is essential, you know. Um, for Malaysia, there has been, you know, like, for example, but, you know, uh, a lot of the ports, the major ports in, in Malaysia, it's only half filled, right? The berths are only half filled, half used. So you can just tell that that's, that's you know, not really, um, not, not, there's not a lot of volumes being pushed forward. There's not a lot of uh, movement push, pushed forward. And that is what we see as a necessity. So cross-border uh, relaxation in terms of certain... Um, restrictions, you know, in terms of uh, circuit breakers, as you well put forward, Andrew, earlier uh, in place, but also to allow trade to still continue. There's still, I think, between Malaysia and Singapore, there is still a fair amount of trade continuing because, you know, there's a lot of dependency anyway from Singapore on Malaysia's uh, supply. Um, but this is where we see a necessity from the uh, economic perspective um, that the movement of um, consumption is necessary. It's really a key aspect that we all need to focus on. Uh, then we also appeal, of course, you know, with APEC and uh, Tasha Rebecca, very lovely to be seeing you, you know, on the PBAC platform, um, that there is a, a way forward, you know, in um, collaboration and cooperation to have these movements of a border uh, between countries to be more robust than where it has been in the last three months or so. Uh, so I, I'm sure Tan Sri Reina will have some insights as well, you know, from his background um, and some media perspective, you know. Um, I, must, I must say, you know, we had our first uh, PBAC roundtable on March, uh, I think it was March, wasn't it, uh, Michael? March 16, if I'm not wrong. And, um, you know, since then, in this couple of months, uh, the market capitalization of uh, Top Love has tripled. So congratulations to Top Love, our PBAC newest uh, member and um, PBAC uh, director for uh, Tan Sri Lim as the PBAC director as well. Right. And I think, um, you know, PBAC members have got uh, a huge <laughs> impact, you know, um, in moving things forward, you know, for different economies and also cross borders. So please, uh, Tanshirina, perhaps you'd like to put your input Okay, in thank you, Adeline. That's wonderful. And Tanshirina, a very warm welcome, and uh, we're delighted uh, that Top Club is uh, a major member of PBEC. Thank you so much. Uh, really just welcome your, your brief reflections on what you've been hearing and the direction of travel uh, you see with regard to trade. I think actually um, we've got a bit of a techno technical hitch there. We got um, yes, we got a bit of a technical hitch. I think Mike, I just as we're approaching, we can't hear Tanshi Rayner there, which is a pity. I think Mike, as we're approaching um, uh, nearing the end of our webinar, maybe I could just open up for people on the call for any particular questions, particularly they have for Rebecca, Rob. Um, uh, ben uh, and Ritesh, any particular matters or any reflections anybody would like to share? I think there's a lot of content here which we will package and um, put out there as part of being the independent voice of trade uh, in, in Pacific Basin. Can I just see if there's any other questions? Mike, can I pass back to you? Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, very quickly, before we... Um ask uh, Ravindra just to share a little bit about Cambodia is passionate about. Um, I've actually done a couple of polls. Um, I'm going to activate them now as three questions quickly that I'd like the participants just to answer. They're multiple choice. You'll see them on your screen coming up, hopefully. And the first one is uh, how do you feel looking ahead at the second half of 2020 economically for China and Southeast Asia? Are you optimistic, opportunistic, cautious, depressed, unsure what to do, bullish? If you could uh, start to answer some of those. Um, 
Uh, you, you've, missed, you've missed one, manic depressive. You've missed one. The second question is, uh, is Asia Pacific geopolitics affecting or starting to affect your business sentiment and decision making? So that's a simple yes, no, or maybe. And then the final question is, what factors are most concerning you as, econ as economies exit lockdowns? And that's multiple choice. There's, you can choose more than one uh, that you're concerned about or, or believe is going to be affecting, in particular, trade um, in the industry. So I see people are starting to vote. That's great. If you can get a few more people, um, and we'll keep that open for a second. So while while people are voting, uh, perhaps I could ask. Let's look um, at having Thomas first quickly. Just if Thomas is there, I'm going to activate Thomas Wong. Is Thomas on the line? Can I see Thomas? Oh, Thomas has left. Okay, Ravindra then. Okay, Ravindra, I'm switching you on. Can you hear us, Ravindra? Hi, everyone. Hi, morning, Ravindra. Can you give us a quick uh, two-minute brief on uh, what you're seeing at Cambodia? R Ravindra, by the way, is the founder of the Cambodian so uh, Society in Hong Kong. Ravindra. Sure. Thanks, uh, Michael. Hi, Andrew. I will try to be concise because uh, of, the, of, the, of, of the time. So um, I will start first with the impact of COVID-19 on the Cambodian economy and then some governmental measures. I think that in Cambodia, tourism uh, has been one one of the industry hardest hit, uh, according to ADB, uh, the decline in tourism revenue is around 900 million. It's equal, equal approximately 3.5% of Cambodia GDP. So obviously, it's not an effect on the retail, entertainment, and also other sectors as hospitality. Uh, and I guess in Cambodia, in addition to the impact of COVID-19, uh, the, the European Union is also partially withdraw trade preferences uh, with the EBS team. So mainly, uh, recently, uh, governmental measures has been taken. Uh, just, just yesterday, I have received from the Ministry of Economy and Finance uh, that it will establish a credit guarantee fund, which is a fund of around 200 million US dollars. Uh, this fund may guarantee loans uh, through banks and financial institutions, but also uh, it has been supported an addi additional financing of 300 million US dollar support to be a catalyst uh, to promote growth uh, in key sectors uh, during and after the crisis. From, uh, from Ministry of Energy, uh, it's implementing an exemption and incentive plan uh, for electricity consumptions that's mainly uh, reach four key sectors, uh, mainly with manufacturing, trade, service, and agriculture, uh, which allow price of electric electricity reduce uh, from minus, uh, minus 25%. Uh, and also uh, from Ministry of Health, um, it will implement protective measures uh, to prevent a second wave of, of COVID-19 and, and last uh, with the ministry, uh, interministerial committee uh, and also um, uh, it has been announced the lift of travel restrictions for foreigners uh, coming from Iran, Italy, Germany, Spain and, and France and, and also the US. Thanks Ravindra. On this, I mean just um, in terms of any policy changes you see coming in with regard to uh, uh, trade in and out of Cambodia, any, 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 any insight is into where you think that may be heading and also with regard to the supply chain question? Well, I, I mean that um, uh, mainly uh, Cambodia, when you speak about uh, industrial zones, as is it, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a improving uh, many new uh, uh, regulation and policies, uh, uh, mainly uh, to open to other uh, foreign investors, because I think that recently uh, Cambodia has been quite tight 
uh, with uh, with China support and 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 obviously also with the Belt and Road Initiative. So there is uh, uh, some uh, uh, new policies coming, and 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 uh, and I think that is also mainly with the impact of EBA uh, that they really try to 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 have more. Uh, uh, multilateral um, uh, uh, trade and, and, and parties. Okay, um, I, I've just shared the results of the polls. Thank you to Ravindra. And I've just, uh, we've got Tantri Rayner back and we've got uh, Thomas Wong. So we'll, we'll conclude with those two gentlemen now. So I'm going to uh, have uh, Thomas quickly just talk and then we'll go to Tantri. One second. So, Thomas, can you hear us? Thomas, can you hear us? Can you need, unmute yourself? Okay, we'll go to Tantri then quickly. Yes, we, we listen. We're very Hi, Tantri. Good morning. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes, we can. can. Yes, we can. So, I okay, think uh, we're very keen to listen to you. Then I, I think we'll, we'll move <laughs> to the concluding given uh, the time schedule. Give, but please take your time, my friend, and we're delighted to have you. <laughs> Give me three minutes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for joining the meeting. It was Lovely. very interesting. Um, for me, and uh, even in the world's perspective, we play a very important role here in the Asia-Pacific region. I'm not referring to any uh, trade issue with China. I just put myself into the center because I'm not on video because I'm still waiting for my first haircut. Number two is, uh, <laughs> number two is uh, Malaysia plays a quite significant role in fighting COVID-19. So we are better than Singapore in terms of absolute numbers. Uh, I'm wondering because uh, being here for 21 years in Malaysia uh, and knowing the culture and all this, uh, I'm very much happy to be among the people in Malaysia because they are much more disciplined than most of the European nations. Uh -huh. really? It is not. You're talking about the French, I assume. Yeah, <laughs> I'm talking about the uh, Director General. That's Dr. Hisham, who is uh, being considered as one of the best doctors in the world. Yeah. So it means it's not politics only. It's primarily a good guy and on top who manages the whole scheme. Number two is the people of Malaysia who are much more disciplined than I ever expected before. And number three, on top, the uh, current um, uh, government is trying to overcome the bridge uh, to a popular, to a um, uh, clear majority vote in the parliament to make them a sound uh, future uh, government. So in the meantime, business goes on. And thanks to COVID-19, we never, ex we, the whole glove industry, never expected to be in such a hype mode where the capacities of all manufacturers, and you need to understand, glove industry is by more than 80% situated in Malaysia. Yeah. So now the whole industry uh, is uh, uh, exporting. So in top glove, uh, the, imp the export number is 90, 99.5%. What does it mean? So the whole bunch of gloves, uh, this year, top glove goes to 80 billion and more beyond uh, the capacity uh, of uh, 100%, not beyond the capacity of 100%, but we are representing about 30% market share, working 24 by 7, all the other industries here. Actually, I go, <clears throat> I receive, that is not a, not an, um, that is for me a daily issue now. I receive because um, I'm known in LinkedIn that I'm uh, in top glove and so on, minimum three official and unofficial requests for uh, inquiries to, to deliver billions of gloves to the world, primarily Europe, Russia, uh, part of uh, into the uh, United States and now also Africa and so request uh, inquiries for delivery of billions of gloves in addition to what is in the market. Mm. So the fact is the, the industry in Malaysia is now booked, fully booked until May or June next year. Remarkable. So, 
So that means what does it have for an impact, not only to be short in gloves in the world, but also uh, I don't have the latest figure in terms of GDP. Is it still positive or negative? But a factor is clearly, although the industry is relatively small in, in, in absolute numbers, uh, that means the glove industry is really super productive in terms of an add-on to the GDP uh, into the plus world. You know, I don't know the number, but uh, it will come out in the next, uh, the next month. So in other words, so it's a happy situation for Malaysia that we have very disciplined people to manage the best, uh, one of the best um, uh, numbers in terms of uh, um, COVID-19 cases and death toll rate. And of course, the industry is doing well. And many people like to work from home, like I do. Many people work like, for, like to work from home. That means the culture of the transformation into the next new world uh, norm is already going on very well. So I enjoy Malaysia very much because the air is cleaner than ever before. No <laughs> more traffic jam. <laughs> Actually, I have a house in the in, in the Alpine region where I enjoy the clean air. No more. To, I don't need and to go there. No yeah. I have. I can enjoy this here in Malaysia as well. Ah, well, look, uh, Tashi read a wonderful, entertaining overview. <laughs> yeah. The future of the world is gloves, as we know. And yeah. uh, it sounds like the glove supply chain of which you're the epicenter is, is working well. So yeah, absolutely, what, yeah. what we'd love to do is I think we'd love to have another session where the top glove story uh, can be shared with members and the ways in which the members can support the top glove story moving forward. I'd love to do that. that that's very interesting. But uh, from what we can hear from you and Adelina and also from Rebecca uh, is that Malaysia seems to be... Um, Looking, look, looking up well, looking up well. Uh, so thank you very much. Sir. Just to wrap up, I mean, very, I, I think we need to finish at 10.45, I'm sorry, uh, uh, in terms of timing. Maybe Thomas, given your great links um, in the region, then also across to Latin America, just very brief reflections on what you're seeing on supply chain. And then I think Mike, then just a very brief summary of, of the polls, which I think in future we should do at the beginning of the call. And then uh, let, let's, let's just wrap up. So Thomas, Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks. Uh, Andrew, good morning, everyone. I'm Thomas Wong, uh, talking about uh, Latin America supply chain. Uh, there are a lot of actually, you know, uh, companies or people in the agricultural sector where they cannot export their goods right now, you know, to China. So therefore, uh, I always believe that, you know, now with the trend of uh, IT going on, particularly e-commerce, you know, this would be a great help, you know, to boost, you know, the, uh, the trade between Latin America and this part of the world. In fact, in my personal uh, business, CPA business, you know, despite of the uh, COVID, I still have inquiries, you know, from Latin America. Like yesterday, I have one company, you know, from Colombia. They will form a company here in Hong Kong. And uh, I've been able to arrange the bank accounts for them, even though they don't have to come to Hong Kong, you know, to open the bank account. So uh, what, what in mind is that if we still want to keep Hong Kong as a global finance hub, you know, I think it's very important, you know, to, uh, you know, give uh, some flexibility for people not to travel to Hong Kong to, their, to, to have their bank account open. I think I, I was talking to a very senior guy of HSBC yesterday, and I think that now something is going on, you know, with the uh, monetary affair that, you know, the talk they are talk, now talking about the ease of, you know, overseas uh, businessmen coming to Hong Kong, not to travel, not to come to Hong Kong, they still can open bank account. And uh, talking about the COVID very quickly, of course, we now know that uh, Brazil now is coming up, you know, in terms of number, which is very sad. The uh, second one is Peru, and the third one is Chile, and the fourth one is uh, Mexico. So uh, they, they still have, uh, you know, very stringent lockdown, uh, yeah, measurements. Okay, so basically their economy is very very badly hurt, and uh, and 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 let's see how if we uh, Hong Kong if we want to manage, you know, to keep the uh, trade going. I think it's how to link them, you know, through e-commerce because you know they cannot come to Hong Kong. They still need to you know, ship their goods, especially their agricultural products, you know, to 1.4 billion people in China. 
I think that's all from my side, Andrew. That's uh, really insightful. And I, I think Thomas brings a unique perspective um, with that Pacific link. And very interesting what you're saying uh, about Chile in particular. Thank you very much, Thomas. So look, can I, if I could just thank everybody very much for taking their time. We'll have a look about how we manage the time in future. These webinars are always tricky. Um, but thank you very much for everyone's time. And maybe I could just pass back um, uh, to Mike just to just run through those polls and then basically just to close out the meeting. But a very big thank you to all our wonderful contributors today. And um, I hope also for people who've been able to listen in, it shows there is an interesting narrative out there and PBEC is able to bring very interesting speakers. And we can continue to look about how we can improve and develop everything we do. But a massive thank you uh, to everybody. And please, uh, I'll pass it back to you, Mike, just to run through the polls and then uh, to wrap up the session. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so yeah, I mean, as people can see on their screen, and um, the three questions have come back with some uh, key points that we can uh, further dis discuss in future uh, meetings over the coming weeks. So the first one is obviously people are feeling opportunistic but cautious at the same time in terms of uh, looking ahead at the second half of this year. Um, over 50% have said yes, the geopolitics are starting to affect their business sentiment and decision making. And the third question too came out on top, which was the obviously concern that Ben mentioned, debt levels that are coming down the pipe potentially, and the movement of people safely from an international perspective. So these are all great feedbacks that we can uh, feed into the narrative and I'll, I'll include these in our newsletter coming up. So once again, I want to um, uh, share what uh, Andrew has mentioned. Thank you for everybody joining this morning. That concludes our third PBEC uh, roundtable dialogue for this year so far. Um, if you'd like to participate and, and speak in our next one or provide content for the newsletter, whether it's by video, I'm happy to do one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting videos. We've got um, an exclusive with our Vice Chairman Moses Cheng coming up in the next newsletter, so look out for that and lots more uh, interesting content. So thank you there. We've finished at 10.45 on the dot. Next time we'll keep it to an hour and uh, enjoy your week. Stay safe wherever you are. And uh, let's try to be optimistic despite. The <laughs> Very good summary, Mike. And uh, let's stay optimistic and, uh, and everyone stay safe. Thank you very much and best wishes to everybody. And thank, thank you, Mike, very much for these arrangements.